So I'd like to, I would like to welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Sonia DiBulio and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. We're so thrilled to kick off another season of the School Lunch and Learn. For those of you who are new to the Lunch and Learn, I wanted to share with you a little bit about its foundations. Did you know it was actually started by the class of 1935? After they graduated, it was tough times finding jobs. So the group used to meet monthly at Fran's restaurant on College Street, and the rest is history, as they say. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for being with us today. I'm so delighted to see such a large turnout for today's presentation. With alumni tuning in from all over the world, we have guests joining us from five different countries, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the US. Welcome to everyone. Before starting today's presentation, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Just a quick housekeeping item. At the end of this, uh, today's presentation, we have time for formal Q&A session. Uh, should you have any questions for Professor Carter uh, during the presentation, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In addition, I would also like to thank everyone who submitted questions during the uh, registration process. We've shared those uh, with Professor Carter before the presentation and he and will continue to share questions that we pick up along the way um, for him to answer during the, the session. Now, without further ado, it honestly gives me great pleasure to introduce our MC and Chair of the Lunch School Lunch and Learn Program, Lori Hevela. Lori is not only an Electrical 65 grad, but he is also one of our most dedicated and engaged members of our alumni community. Lori has been chairing the School Lunch and Learn Program for several, several years and continues to generously dedicate his time to maintaining lunch and learn long established tradition, their lunch and learns long established traditions. And with that, I will pass it over to Lori to welcome our speaker for today's event. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for the very warm introduction. It's great to be back for another season of Lunch and Learn. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of some of our dearest alumni who were closely affiliated with the School Lunch and Learn. Since we last held our Lunch and Learn in May of this year, we sadly last lost three members of the class of 5T3, Warren Brown, Barry Blanchard, and Bill Kirkpatrick. All three of them attended in person when they were able, and Bill was an active member of our School Lunch and Learn Committee. He was also a past recipient of the 3T5 Second Mile Award. We also sadly lost Bob Ross from the class of 6T0, who was also closely connected as his father Vernon Ross was one of the original members of the class of 3T5. Bob was an active member of the prestigious 3T5 Second Mile Award Selection Committee. Their presidents, their presence will forever be missed and their contributions to Lunch and Learn never forgotten. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, Professor Michael Carter, who will discuss the challenges facing the healthcare industry and potential engineering related solutions to it. Michael Carter is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering here at the University of Toronto he was also the founding director of the Center for Healthcare Engineering in 2009. As of February 2021, Mike has supervised 28 PhD and 104 master's students and directed more than 305 undergraduate engineering students in over 137 projects with industry partners. He is a four-time winner of the annual practice prize from the Canadian Operational Research Society and received the CORS Award of Merit for lifetime contributions to Canadian operational research. He is on the editorial board for the journals Healthcare Management Science, 
operations research for healthcare, health systems, and double IE transactions on healthcare systems. He's an adjunct scientist for the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences here in Toronto, and a member of the Faculty Advisory Council for the U of T chapter of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He was not only inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, but he was also inducted as a fellow of INFORMS, the International Society for Operations Research and Management Science, and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. 2019, he won the Northrop Frye Award for Teaching Excellence from the U of T Alumni Association. And this year, he was awarded the U of T President's Impact Award for contributions to improving healthcare here in Canada. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Carter. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks very much, Lori. Um, so I've been uh, working in healthcare for about 30 years now. And um, a buddy of mine sent me this cartoon. Um, my message has not always been welcomed in hospital, open mic night at the hospital. Uh, some days I've felt a little bit like that. This is my, uh, this is the last time I had a, a lab me a, a photo in person. Everything's been online for the last two years. Um, and most of these uh, students, this was most of the students in May 2018, uh, the last two just graduated um, and uh, Jenya and Tahara just finished their PhD uh, last month. Uh, but I have a whole new crop of uh, students and many of them I met for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago when we met in person. So the, in my talk, what I want to do is I want to give, the, uh, give you a sense about the, uh, a brief overview of the healthcare system. And uh, most Canadians, most Canadians think our system is pretty good. And I'm, uh, I have to tell you that our, the medical care that we get in healthcare is outstanding. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, I'd say second to none. But the actual system itself has got a lot of holes in it. I think most Canadians think they understand the system. They think they know how it works. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to uh, open the uh, open the blinds a little bit and have a look at it. I'm going to try to explain why I think we need engineers, and I'm going to give you some practical examples of uh, things that we've done. So first of all, healthcare is is huge. Our healthcare is the largest industry in North America. Estimated total cost in 2019 was uh, 265 billion in Canadian, 3.8 trillion in the US. Um, people, you know, look at this 2019, uh, how come I can't update my slides? Well, that is the updated number. We actually don't know what we spent until uh, two years after the fact. Uh, 2020 is a, an estimate and of course, COVID has thrown everything off. In Canada in 2019, we spent over $7,000 per person, man, woman, and child. And uh, well, as seniors, we may be getting close to that number, uh, but most people under 65 don't think they spend anywhere near $7,000. And the issue is that it's actually very skewed. It's highly skewed uh, towards um, people at end of life, and then plus made people with major chronic diseases diabetes, cancer, kidney failure, dialysis, et cetera. And chronic diseases is almost 70% of the total cost with a relatively small part of the population. It's interesting to note that Canada, we spent in US dollars in 2019, we spent about $5,000, 5,300 US. The US was spending $11,500 per person. So they're spending more than twice uh, what we are up to. A healthcare spending is a percentage of GDP, and you see it's been going up. The U.S. looked like they were well; they're seventeen percent, close to seventeen percent. Uh, and I, I went to update this slide, and I couldn't find the, the the most recent numbers. And then I found on OECD, I found this is what it's been since 2010. So it's been flat. So the U.S. is spending about sixteen and a half percent. Canada is in with the pack. We're spending about 11% of GDP. 
I threw in Mexico. Mexico is a little over, a little under six percent, and so we're right in with uh, most of the industrialized countries. Um, and one of the things is that this this eleven percent of GDP that means eleven cents out of every dollar is a healthcare dollar in Canada. And I uh, just to pick on the U.S. a little bit. The uh, it's, this is an unfair comparison, but this is life expectancy at birth, uh, and then as, as on a chart based on life on uh, on the healthcare spending, and you see that U.S. is spending way more. This is back to 2014, 2013. U.S. is spending way more, but the life expectancy at birth, it just doesn't fit the pattern for everyone else. It's it's an outlier. The reasons for that, uh, I wouldn't even. I, I could guess, but uh, that's uh, not clear at all. This is a, a U.S. cartoon. Under my proposed um, health plan, those who can afford medical care will pay their bills, and those who can't will remain sick. Uh, and that joke is actually a little bit, uh, a little bit frightening in some ways. Um, and fun fact: fun fact, people don't realize that the U.S. is actually a public health care system by definition. You're public if more than half of the cost of health care is paid for by the government, by federal, by federal, provincial, state systems. The U.S. is 53% of the cost of health care is public. 23% is Medicare, sorry, 21% is Medicare. So anybody over 65 basically gets Canadian style health care in the US. Medicaid is anyone 16%. Anybody who's below the poverty line gets the same, uh, gets included in the same uh, category. Uh, there's federal programs are 10%, including things like the Veterans Administration, and then 6% is state and local governments. So that and, and if you look at the if you look at the cost per capita, so 53% of that $11,500 per person works out to $6,138 US is the cost. That's how much the, the government is paying per person for health care in the US. Canada, in Canada, we're paying 70, the government is paying 70% of the cost of our 5,300 for 3,710. The US is paying the government on the public side twice as much as, as Canada is, and they're not getting, the, they're not getting the same results. So Canadian Medicare, very briefly, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if people realize this, uh, what it means. So the Canada Health Act, was passed in, in 1984. It was actually a combination of two pieces of legislation, 1957 Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act covered basically hospital care. In 1967, the Medical Care Act, it covered doctors. So the Canada Health Act put those two together, but it added five, uh, it added five uh, requirements. And the requirements were accessible, so you couldn't have user fees, portable between province, universal, everybody's covered, uh, comprehensive, it covers all, all medically necessary things, and publicly administered, uh, government administered, right? So those are the things. The providers in Canada are private. They're not public. In the UK, the NHS, most people actually work for the NHS. In Canada, doctors, etc. They are they are... Uh, they're private, independent practitioners. The key thing, so the Canada Health Act, they, the federal government said that if the provinces provided, if the provinces joined the Canadian Medicare system, then the federal government would pay 50% of the cost. The Canada Health Act, it was a combination of those two original pieces of legislation. The Canada Health Act covers things if it's done in a hospital, and if it's done by a doctor, and if it's medically necessary. Well, medically necessary varies by province, but uh, a lot of different things, okay? The, uh, so that's, that is, and Canada, Canadian healthcare, in many, in many respects, it hasn't really changed since 1984 on the federal side, okay? What's wrong with Canadian healthcare? Well, um, it doesn't cover a lot of things. If it's not done by a doctor, if it's not done in a hospital, it's not covered. So it doesn't cover drugs, 
Now, your drugs in the hospital are free, but the moment you walk out, you have to pay for it. Doesn't cover dentists, optometrists, home care. Home care doesn't cover nurses. Nurses are not doctors. Nurses are not, home care doesn't work in hospitals. Doesn't cover long-term care. There's inadequate mental health coverage. Hospitals and doctors, that covers psychiatrists in hospitals. It does not cover psychologists, psychotherapists, counselors, any other, any community programs, they don't get covered. It doesn't cover allied health. So physiotherapy, occupational therapy, social work, speech and language, personal support workers, those are covered now physiotherapy, occupational, th those were covered for people working in the hospital. But the moment you start practicing outside, they're no longer covered. No ambu ambulance services are not covered by the by Canadian healthcare. Midwives, private labs are not covered. The labs are covered in the hospital, but outside the outside the hospital is not covered. All right, so that all of these things, they're not now that the provinces uh, can they can elect to pick up some of these things. So a lot of these things are covered by uh, so home care, for example, in Ontario, uh, a lot of home care costs are covered. Now, if you want home care, uh, you can wait for public home care, uh, or you can pay for it and get it immediately. And by the way, from the same provider. Same with long-term care. Their long-term care is provided by the uh, by the province. Um, uh, it's and there are um, publicly uh, funded beds. People get uh, based on income are are given provided, but it's not covered under the federal system. Right? The um, the big ticket item currently and the, and the big change that people are talking about that could we, we could eventually see with the um, uh, with the federal Medicare system is uh, the uh, potential uh, national pharmacare so that, you know, can we get pharmacare drugs included under Canadian healthcare drugs since 1984, the cost of drugs has skyrocketed and it's probably a billion dollar ticket item. And of course, nobody's paying any attention to this right now because of uh, uh, because of uh, uh, COVID. We'll get back to that. Um, the other big problem is that there is no system. Everybody operates independently. The hospitals are private. Hospitals, most of the hospitals are private. They do not report to the government. They get government funding. They also get funding from other places. They all have their own boards. They do their own thing. Uh, they do what's best for the hospital. Same with doctors, right? So there is no system. There's no patient flow. There's very limited data. There's very, there's very limited data sharing uh, and very inefficient processes. And to illustrate, so if you have a medical problem, what you do is you call your family doctor and then you have to wait to see your family doctor, assuming it's not an emergency. Uh, then your doctor will send you out for testing. So you have to wait for testing. Then you have to wait again to see your family doc to find out the results of the test. Then you have to wait for a referral to a specialist. And once you see the specialist, you have to wait for admission to a hospital. And then once you get out of the hospital, you have to wait for rehab or you have to wait for home care or you have to wait for long term care. This is not an efficient system. It's not like treating patient first. Right. And these are system issues. These are system problems. There's no care coordinator or navigator. It's supposed to be your family doc, but typically they get results months after the fact. You know, the surgeon, the surgeon will send a, a report, a discharge summary to the doc, to your doc, but they won't get it for later. And they probably won't review it until you have your next uh, appointment. I always, I always tell people that, you know, the often the two most important political issues for Canadians, Canadians want better health care and they want lower taxes. And few people have figured out that there's a relationship between those. Okay. How bad is Canadian health care? This is a Commonwealth report. It's a New York based private foundation. It's actually started almost 100 years ago by a, a, a woman philanthropist, Anna Harkness established in 1918. And uh, the mission was to purport, was to in part uh, to promote high performing healthcare system. So it was aimed at the US healthcare system. You know, what are we doing and how could we do things better? Every three years, they produce a detailed report uh, on international healthcare systems called Mirror Mirror. So let's, let's look at what the US is doing. Let's look at what everybody else is doing. 
and they survey, they send out surveys to patients, to doctors, countries, plus administrative data. They collect a lot of data to measure the, the efficiency, the effectiveness. So they look at care processes, they look at access, look at administrative efficiency, equity, and healthcare outcomes. And then they rank the countries based on all of these. And you'll see the US on the last column is ranked 11th out of 11 countries on everything except care processes. Care processes are pretty good. Canada, on the other hand, is ranked 10th. We are way down the list on most of the processes. And uh, standard joke is that if, uh, if uh, the US had universal health care, Canada would be dead lashed. I think this is disgraceful. The US and Canada are two of the most wealthy countries in the world. North America has pretty much the worst health care system, of, the worst health care setup of uh, uh, any of the industrialized countries. And we're not doing enough about it. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Okay. So why do we need engineers? Why do we need engineers? So many of the problems that I've talked about or that I've, I've issued are the ones that are um, documented in the Commonwealth Report. These are systems issues. So like I said, the medical care we're getting is great when you finally get it. But the processes and the systems around helping people get in are not that good. All right. So um, that we, what we need is we need, we need better decision support tools for one. Like a lot of the things that we do, the clinicians, the policy makers, et cetera, they just don't have the tools to understand. People are doing things by the seat of their pants. They're making up, they're making decisions without the documentation. Um, healthcare decisions are not data driven. Well, partly because we don't have data and partly because we don't have the models to, to help us interpret the data. Uh, Doc, Don Berwick, so Don Berwick, uh, he founded the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and under um, President Obama, he became the uh, CEO of the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, Don has been claiming for years that 30% of the cost of health care is waste, that we could cut 30% out of the cost just by eliminating waste. Now, he was talking about the U.S. healthcare system, but based on my own experience of hanging around hospitals and hanging around uh, agencies, I think that's absolutely true in Canada too. Um, and offline, I can give people lots of examples. That, and yeah, one of the issues too that I discovered, doctors are not trained in population level decisions. Doctors are trained in medical school to look after an individual patient. The patient in front of you is the one, that's the one we worry about. And then the next patient comes in, that's the one we focus on. Right? They're not really looking at, po at population level, except for, um, you know, um, health policy, uh, population level doctors, public health docs. Um, and there's the other, the other thing to keep in mind too, and, and through my, as I go through my examples, that there's a quantitative and a qualitative aspect to healthcare. And I deal with the, the I looking at the modeling part, the data part, the quantitative part, there's always a qualitative issue about healthcare. Healthcare people get focused on the qualitative side and ignore the quantitative, right? We really have to get a balance between the two. Okay. So um, other issue too, in, in terms of engineering and systems engineering is a lot of the issues are balancing supply and demand. Uh, so there's the, um, so there's long delays in uh, uh, rebalancing supply. So doctors, nurses, hospital beds, uh, long-term care. Engineers can forecast demand into the future. And we don't, mostly policymakers make that decision after the fact. You know, I tell people that healthcare is driven by headlines in the Globe and Mail in Canada. That, you know, they'll say, oh, there's a shortage. We have to do something about it. Well, it'll take years if you don't, if you don't forecast and look into the future. Uh, shift scheduling. ED resources need to match variable demand. And one example, I uh, did some work with a hospital in Ottawa, and they discovered that, you know, they felt that the, the number of arrivals in the emergency department in the evening was higher. So they had uh, more doctors working on the evening shift than on the day shift. 
but their shifts were defined as eight to four, four to 12 and 12 to 12 to eight in the morning uh, on the night shift. So they had three docs working on the uh, night evening shift from four to 12, and they had one doc working on the night shift from 12 to eight in the morning. Now, the problem was that uh, the demand was actually from 6 p.m. until two in the morning. Anybody showing up after midnight was going to be there for an awfully long time. They didn't look at the data, right? and it was pretty simple and pretty easy to do. Uh, wait lists are actually useful in healthcare, which is odd. Uh, people don't, and, and this is something we can manage. You, know, you, you, you don't want a doctor to have nobody on their wait list for surgery. Uh, you don't want uh, resources like MRI, CT to have nobody on the wait list and just have the machine sitting around. One of the reasons health, U.S. healthcare is so expensive is because they actually do have excess capacity. So they have machines that are only running 50% of the time. I can go to Buffalo and get an MRI tomorrow. Um, no problem, right? And pay for it, okay? Um, MRI, then the other thing, and it's happened in Ontario in particular, MRI supply drives demand. So they've been, Ontario has been trying to catch up by building more, um, more equipment and putting more things in place. And uh, one of the things that we've discovered is that as we add more supply, the doctors say, oh, well, we're getting results faster. So they order more, right? So appropriateness is the big question now in diagnostic imaging. Are people ordering, you know, I got a headache. Let's do an MRI, see if you've got a brain tumor. Highly unlikely, uh, probably not appropriate, but we do it anyway, okay. Um, I'm gonna look at, you know, there's a few problems I'm gonna look at. And um, I'm going to look at, you know, some of the problem types that engineers deal with regularly. Uh, a, a lot of the things, too, I tell people that um, a lot of the th problems that I see in healthcare, care, um, manufacturing solved them 30 years ago. And uh, and healthcare is way behind. So a lot of times when I see problems, I can take examples and models from manufacturing and from production and from service industries and apply them directly to uh, healthcare problems. You know, a great example is Lean and uh, Six Sigma and the processes that we look at, we look at today. Japan invented them in the 50s. Uh, North America uh, started using them uh, in a big way in the 1970s. Healthcare discovered them after, you know, after 2000. Um, nobody was doing it. Right? Uh, so some of the problem types, scheduling, facility location, where to locate ambulances, hospitals, clinics, facility layout, I'll show you an example, uh, supply and demand forecasting, waitlist management, and then policy impact analysis. And I'll show you, this is health human resource planning, and I'll show you an example. Oh yeah, so the, uh, yeah, here's a, 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 a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. I love Calvin and Hobbes. I thrive on change. You, you threw a fit this morning because your mom put less jelly on your toast than yesterday. I thrive on making other people change. Oh, well, guilty as charged. I'm not great on change. All right, so let me show you some examples of some of the things that we've done. Uh, this is an example of a mathemat using mathematical optimization uh, for a decision support tool. Uh, Brendan Egan was a PhD student uh, under with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Tim Chan and I supervising. And we were looking at uh, Women's College Hospital. This is a few years ago. So Women's College Hospital built in 1911, 280,000 patient visits annually. There's the old hospital. And what they did uh, about 10 years ago, uh, they tore down the old, they first of all, they stopped doing uh, uh, inpatient they stopped doing inpatient uh, at all. All all inpatients were were uh, uh, deleted, and everything became ambulatory. So they were just doing clinics. Uh, they were just uh, operating clinic space, and uh, so we had a project between 20, 2012 and twenty fourteen. They were moving into so they moved in tore down the old hospital and they built a new one, and you can see it down College Street, and the three floors of this are ambulatory space, ambulatory clinic space. And everybody stuffed into this thing, right? And um, the clinics, what happened was when they canceled all the inpatient beds in the old building, all of these rooms were now empty. And so the clinics just expanded like crazy. They had tons of extra space. 
So the clinics could actually have permanent space, even though they might only work two or three days a week, they had permanent space with permanent exam rooms. Uh, there was just lots of space. Of course, that was all being torn down uh, and they were building and the new space was, uh, was tight. They've got exam rooms, etc. cetera. Uh, the uh, hoteling policy was required, three fourths of clinic space um, and a couple of hundred rooms. Okay. And the, uh, so all the clinics would fit so they all the clinics there there is enough uh, space, but unfortunately not at the right time. So the um, no one wants to be Friday after people don't want their clinics on Friday afternoon. Monday's also less popular because of statutory holidays. The doctors like lots of exam rooms. We asked them how many they need. They told us lots. Um, they like to you know put a patient in a room and the nurse goes in and the fellow goes in and the doctor goes in and they rotate through a bunch of different rooms. Uh, the more the merrier, right? And all their clinics, all their clinics, the patients want all their clinics on the same day. Patients have preferences, and so congestion is created by the schedule. Um, so after we we did our mathematical programming model. Um, and so we, the, actually building the model was fairly, fairly straightforward. The rules, but the rules kept changing, um, including the number of clinics required. Every time we showed them, we, they say, here are the rules. We would run the model, go back, have a meeting, and they would say, oh, we forgot to tell you, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't include this, you didn't include that, et cetera. We went through over two years, went through 11 iterations, more data, et cetera. And finally, and the issue really wasn't the modeling part. The issue in healthcare over and over again is change management. So listen, we've all got to fit in this space. This has already been decided. Uh, there, there's capacity complaints on, on, on each floor. There's nothing, we, you know, you can complain about it all you like, but this is what we've got to deal with, right? And uh, so they changed a lot of things, and we managed that over two years. And uh, they, they, our, our final solution was the one that they went with. Um, <clears throat> a facility location problem. So the uh, facility location problem, I'm going to show you a map in a second. So we've got uh, facility location. So we've got a bunch of red dots, and the red dots are demand. So where we need people. So the red dots could be 911 calls. It could be people who need a CT scan. Uh, it could be people who had cardiac arrests, right? And we're deciding where to place ambulances or fire stations for 911 calls, uh, CT scanners for the demand, or portable defibrillators in particular. So the uh, AEDs, automated external defibrillators, right? Looks like this, okay? And my colleague, Tim Chan, has done a lot of work with uh, uh, AED location in Toronto, in Ontario, and uh, a little bit in India, other places. So here's an example of, uh, you know, Toronto and all the red dots, the red dots, each red dot represents over several years, a cardiac arrest that occurred in a public place in the city of Toronto. So this was a public, uh, uh, a public event, right? And so if we assume that there are places that are more likely to have, uh, you know, that, that, that the, the likely places are, it's going to happen again, is history going to repeat itself? Maybe, maybe not, but this should give us an idea. Now the blue dots here, uh, if, a, if an AED is located, we really, in order to be useful, an AED had to be within about hundred meters of, uh, of uh, cardiac arrest. So the blue dots on this problem, these are the AEDs, the publicly accessible AEDs that are already available. And so we can look at all the red dots that have been covered, and then we can ask the question, and uh, uh, the uh, Tim worked with the city on this problem, you know, where do you put the next 30 dots? You're, each one of these AEDs cost about $2,000, I think. And so where do you put the next 30 dots to collect the most red dots? And again, this can be expressed as a mathematical problem. Yeah. Um, hospital bed capacity planning. Here's another problem that we looked at. Um, and hospitals regularly complain they don't have enough beds. Ministry of Health responds, well, you're not using your beds efficiently. So the question was, how many beds does a hospital actually need? Right? And so I had a, a 
student, uh, master student, he now works for, he's now an analyst with uh, University Health Network. And uh, so Tien um, worked on uh, an Excel model using a year's worth of actual hospital data to estimate the number of admissions, the length of stay, the bed occupancy, if things continue at the same level. So if we continue to do, uh, you know, the, the busy days, uh, how, what's your bed occupancy? And we broke it down by shift. So we broke it down by the day shift, the evening shift and the night shift, how many beds did you need? Estimate, and then we ran, ran a model that did a bit of a simulation that estimated the range of beds required for each shift. So some days are higher than others, some days are lower than others. So here's an example at one hospital we ran. And so the number of beds, ward beds required, and you see the, the, uh, uh, the line is the average number and then the hash marks are 90% uh, confidence interval around that mean. It follows a very, very similar pattern week after week. And I, we've seen this at every hospital we've looked at, that on Monday, the demand for beds is low and it grows up to Thursday and Friday, hits a peak on Friday. The reason for that is on the surgical side of the hospital, doctors only operate, the most of the operations handled are handled from Monday to Friday. So the beds fill up, then over the weekend, they, uh, they empty out and then they start again on Monday. Staffing levels are flat over the, for the week. The beds are flat over the week. Uh, supply and demand, they don't match. Okay. And one of the things is that we realized that uh, we could, you know, some surgeons are just doing mostly day surgery. Other surgeons are doing people with a long length of stay. And so uh, we asked the question, you know, can we actually swap blocks? The way scheduling for uh, uh, operating room time works in Canada in most places is that a doctor will have a day in the operating room. So Dr. Smith will always operate on Monday in operating room number one, and they bring in their patients. Okay. And so one of the, so Tian looked at a model, what would happen if we swapped people, if we just swapped Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones from Monday to Friday and vice versa. So this is one, and this was actually at a Regina hospital. Uh, this is actual. So you see on Monday, and the peak is in the day shift, which is interesting. Um, the peak was in the day shift. So we had, they needed 46 surgical beds on Monday um, in, in the daytime, and that went up to 59 surgical beds on Friday. And so he said, well, can we, can we balance that out over the week? And so here, the pink ones are the ones that... So Tian just took individual docs, swapped these two. Can you get an improvement? Swapped another two. The pink ones are the ones that moved. Okay, and you know this is we know this is not going to be popular with the docs, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this is what he wound up with. Instead of fifty-nine beds on Friday, he now needs fifty-three beds pretty much across the week. We just shaved six beds on Friday. Now, we did this based on how many beds we needed. We did not do this based on how many beds they had in the hospital. What happens in many hospitals is by Thursday and Friday, there aren't enough beds, so surgery gets canceled. Doctors are working fee for service, and if surgery gets canceled, they don't get paid. So there is an incentive for the docs to balance the workload so that they don't have cancellations later in the week. Now, now, I want Dr. Smith to switch with Dr. Jones so that Jones doesn't get canceled. Well, why would Smith switch? He was doing fine, right? So it's a, it's, it's a balancing act. But the other thing we noticed was that when Tien is doing his switching, it's actually, the process is actually, um, uh, uh, most of the benefit it comes out of the first three or four swaps. And then after that, after that, it becomes the marginal improvement goes down and down. Right. So we probably didn't need to do anywhere near those swaps to get most. 53 is probably the best we could do, um, but we could probably get down to 55 without making a lot of difference, right? The other thing is that the routine is interactive. So we, when he suggests a swap, we could say, we don't want to do that. We want to do something else. Okay. Yeah, when the music stops, grab a bed, UK cartoon. Yeah, the hospitals are a little bit like that some days, okay? Um, I'm going to do a simulation model. We did a simulation model based on, so this is for perioperative decision support systems. So perioperative, so this is the operating room schedule, but perioperative is things around the operating room schedule, so before and after. And this is uh, Daphne Sneakers was one of my PhD students, now with Ontario Health, uh, Carolyn Busby, 
uh, uh, came along and did a, 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 a revised version. Um, and uh, just the idea is to try to model patient flow from the decision to operate with the surgeon through to the patient uh, uh, being discharged from the hospital. We wanted to build a flexible model so we could do what if analysis. Okay? So we wanted to balance the use of downstream resources, recovery room, wards, beds, nurses, uh, and you know, surgeons have other priorities. So you know, moving surgeons around, Tien's model was just swapping, uh, moving surgeons around, that's, they have clinics, teaching, research. There's other priorities going on, waitlist priorities and throughput. We want, to, we want to do more surgeries on hip and knee replacement or something. Uh, we've got overtime and undertime, and how's that managed? Uh, urgent patients, estimated versus actual time. We have the estimated time. We schedule based the estimated time. We use the actual time to figure out how much they actually took, and we use real patients in our simulation model. We use a year's worth of data. And then cancellation policies. When do you cancel surgery? And it's a little bit up in the air. In the simulation model, we needed an exact one. So people go through, this is the model structure, people go through, surgeon decides uh, on the day of surgery, if there's, uh, on the day of surgery, if there's no bed available, you cancel surgery. If there's no time left, you cancel the last case. We wanna to try to imitate what actually happens in the hospital. And then ALC, alternate level of care, patients are discharged from the hospital, they're medically discharged, but they can't leave because there's no place to go. For example, into long-term care, if there's no bed available. Uh, as an example of, we've used this in multiple places. Uh, as an example in Saskatchewan, we used it, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Minister of Health in 2011 announced that no one was going to wait for more than three months for surgery of any kind. Well, actually the 90th percentile, 90% of people will be seen within three months. So one of the hospitals, Victoria Hospital in Northern Saskatchewan, their orthopedic wait times, their average times was eight months. The 90th percentile was 18 months in 2011. And they're supposed to get this down to three months by 2014. And they go like, OK, we can do that, but we need a new orthopedic surgeon. We need more OR time. We need um, and we need uh, two million dollars uh, and we need uh, a new operating room to be built. OK. So we used our surgical model. We actually went up there in January, and this is a you know a open mic night at the hospital. You can imagine how popular the Ministry of Health um, actually contracted with us to go up and help them decide whether they it could be more efficient. And you can imagine how popular that was. So we used our model and we uh, and predicted arrivals. We used our surgical model and we discovered that by they actually had to make some change. They were inefficient. They had to change the way they were doing it. They did need the two million dollars. They did need the extra surgeon and the other one. If they got all that, then they actually could get their wait times down to under three months by 2014. But general surgery was growing and it was it was shorter than ortho at, in 2011, but it was growing over time. So, and they also had some serious bed capacity issues that the model told them about. Okay, uh, we've used this model at 14 hospitals in Ontario and Saskatchewan, uh, and looking at performance measurement and looking at scenario testing. Currently working on the model at uh, um, at the uh, University Health Network in Toronto. Okay. Yeah, work smarter, not harder, famous industrial engineering line. Then again, if you're not very smart, it's okay to just work harder. Okay. Um, human resources modeling. I'm um, watching time. Um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to, Laurie, I think I'm going to take another five minutes on it. I'm getting close. Um, got a couple more examples that I'd like to get through. So uh, how many doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, et cetera, do we need for it to meet demand? Canada's a really poor job of modeling. Uh, we had uh, one model that we did for the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons. Um, uh, Chris Menfindel, head, head of cardiac surgery at UHN. Uh, Tim Latham was from, is from Vancouver. Uh, Chris was the president of the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons and Tim was the vice president. They were worried because what they were, what the problem with cardiac surgery was in the catheterization lab, people have heard about stents and, and people using catheters 
to open up arteries and catheters and putting in stents to keep them open. Uh, so this has been reducing the demand for cardiac surgery. You didn't need to do open somebody's chest. Uh, in particular in Canada, and what's, because there's lower demand, people who are graduating from residency in cardiac surgery couldn't get a job. So students in medical school were not signing up for cardiac surgery. In particular in Canada in 2011, five out of the 11 slots, there were 11 residency positions, hospitals wanted residents. They couldn't get them, they only got five. There was one more on a second round and one more international in 2009. They filled about half of the positions. And this was an international problem, the same thing happened in the US. It was fascinating, one of the things that I discovered we all know about baby boomers, you know, we're, everybody's worried about the threat of baby boomers overwhelming our health care system. Um, this project made me realize that, of course, the providers are also baby boomers and they are going to retire just when we need them most. Um, the average age for many professions is over 50. Um, in 2009, I got the age of every cardiac surgeon in Canada. Turns out cardiac surgeons actually retire at 65. The orthopods work into their 80s, but the cardiac surgeons go early. Uh, one, one surgeon told me it was the on-call shifts that do it. Um, but it takes 10 years to train a new one. So we estimate fifth, almost 50% of cardiac surgeons are going to retire in, the, in 10 to 15 years uh, from 2009. But the baby boomers, that's just when the baby boomers, uh, cardiac surgery occurs in people from ages about 65 to 80. You don't do really old people, you don't do young people. And uh, that's when the baby boomers are just starting to hit that in 2009. So that the, 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 the demand is going up right at the time when the providers are disappearing. But it takes 10 years to train a new one. So we looked at, we did our, we did modeling, we did something called system dynamics to model you know, when are we going to start to see a shortage? And what we discovered was that we're going to have in, in Canada, we're going to have, you know, there's an oversupply up to about the 2022, 2024. After that, we're then going to see a shortage of, uh, of cardiac surgeons. And so come around 2026, 2028, we're going to see headlines on the Globe and Mail. Guess what? It takes 10 years to train a new one. So the, the, we need to be able to look ahead. We need to be able to see what's coming. And those are the kinds of models we can do, right? Um, I'm just going to do this. Yeah, one of my, uh, I'll do this quickly. So a friend at the Ministry of Health said, I want a model of the healthcare system and uh, in particular for the aging at home strategy. And so I got a PhD student. This is a model of the healthcare system uh, with a, uh, and I would happy to give out details later. Aliyah Sen, so I developed this model uh, and it's brilliant. Um, uh, here's, here's one we did for our system dynamics model for mental health in Ontario and looking at all of the factors and what the, it's basically a large influence diagram, but we can also turn this into a quantitative model. Uh, and then one of the other things we did, I'll do quickly, uh, we looked at, uh, uh, aging at home strategy. So aging at home strategy, the government gave a pile of money to increase uh, programs to keep seniors at home so seniors could stay at home instead of going to long term care. Um, and they said, so the, the various LINs across the 14 LINs across the province wanted a tool to understand where the demand was and where the supply was. So the demand is based on for adult day programs, it's based on cognitive ability, but it's also based on age. So we actually used a, a long form of the census to estimate the demand in, this is for Toronto, the, the dark red ones are the areas of high demand. And then we did the supply. This is for adult day programs for Toronto Central. And this, the dark blue ones are ones with high supply. I actually had a large number of, uh, of students call every one of the major suppliers for adult day programs and say, what's your catchment area? How far out you go? And we drew a map based on that. Put the two things together, there was a high supply in the central core of Toronto, the demand was out in Etobicoke and Scarborough. And so if somebody called up to the, uh, the, the Lynn and said, we want to have, we want to in, in, put another uh, adult day program in downtown Toronto, uh, the answer is no. The, um, the actual planners actually knew this, but it was intuitive. They really liked the idea of having the model. Okay. So in conclusion, sorry, Laurie, in conclusion, healthcare is a major industry. The system is just not sustainable as it is. Uh, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> and uh, 
engineers can, I think engineers can really help. We can really do something. Like I said, a lot of the issues are not medical. The issues are systems thinking, systems approach. And here's my final one here. Uh, this is, uh, I call this Mike Carter solves the problems of the Canadian healthcare. Uh, and the professor says, I think you should be a little more explicit in step two, uh, then a miracle occurs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we do have a number of questions in the Q&A. Uh, in the interest of time, if you have a burning question, I would ask that you add it. We have four that I will begin to address. Uh, the first uh, comment is during the recent federal election, the Liberal government committed to hiring 7,500 more GPs. The question is, is this the best way to address the current shortfall? Or can engineering make GPs in Canada more efficient in their work to reduce the need to add more? How do you believe that they can do that? What ways will they do that? For example, recruiting from abroad. And how long will this realistically take? <laughs> Um, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, could they be more efficient? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that uh, uh, primary care has become more efficient. They're working in teams. So uh, Ontario has started using family health teams, uh, you know, like it and, and part of it was the funding policy that the GP was funded. You know, I, I, I couldn't get my flu shot unless it was done by a GP because that's the only way they got paid for it. Well, now we've got health teams where a nurse can do it, the GP doesn't have to. So we can, based on our funding, we can make it more efficient. Um, and another, another simple example is for rehab. Rehab was only funded for inpatient, in hospital. Outpatient rehab was not covered. Lots of people could have got rehab by outpatient costing a lot less money, but because it isn't funded, it's, it's discouraged. Uh, there, it, and the list goes on. Yes, we could be more efficient, Yes, we do need more GPs. Yes, they have to be funded properly. <laughs> Thank you. The second question, with many issues in healthcare being systematic and feeding into each other uh, in, in a negative feedback loop, it seems that when a specific issue is addressed, the problem shifts to another part of the system. The question is, how can one approach systematic issues piecewise while at the same time demonstrating value and managing the constant formal policies and informal process changes. That was a mouthful. That very well done, Laurie. <laughs> they, I mean, I would say that that's that's precisely uh, the you know that 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 systems industrial engineering, systems engineering, engineers in general. That the, that's precisely the kind of thing that that uh, that we do. You know. What is the effect of making a change here? So my system dynamics model of the healthcare system, for example, that I didn't go into any detail on, uh, you know, if you change this, how does it influence the other uh, other parts of the system? And that's precisely the kind of uh, the, the important uh, kind of modeling we need to do. And it's precisely what decision makers typically don't do. Um, healthcare is siloed. Individuals at different areas are making decisions um, on, you know, I'm going to fix this piece. I'm going to put 7,500 new GPs in. Well, yeah, but where are they going to work? How are they going to work? Yeah, yes, I think engineering modeling absolutely um, uh, can help. Thank you. Uh, the last question, or the question that just came in a minute ago, are there any solutions for the mental health systemic problems. A lot of what you've talked about have been for the traditional health concerns. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that that is actually uh, one of my key focus areas right now, that mental health, as I said, you know, mental health um, covers uh, psychiatrists and uh, mental health institutions. Uh, it does not cover community. It does not cover programs. Those things are actually covered a lot by provincial, you know, bits and piece programs. Uh, but it's not really part of medical medical care. I have a current PhD student who is looking at modeling demand and supply and protect, we're focusing on child and youth mental health uh, just to keep the scope down because the scope is so big. What kinds of programs could be offered on the community? Uh, my theory is that if we could treat people in the community, we could prevent people showing up in the emergency department with a total collapse. Um, uh, a lot more effectively and a lot more efficiently. Uh, that remains to be seen. In, intuitively, it makes sense, but we have to prove it. 
and then we have to prove it to the policymakers. Thank you. Uh, next question for Mandy Sun. Data, both quantity and quality, are key to a robust mathematical model. Model. The question is, how do you ensure data integrity during the data collection process? Andy, nice to nice to hear from you. Haven't seen you for ages. Um, the uh, absolutely like data is data is my huge problem. I go into a hospital and I say, have you got data? They say we got tons of data, and I say, well, do you have this? Oh, no, we don't collect that. They don't collect process data. They don't collect, they collect data for clinical purposes, for the bean counters, for the, for the uh, uh, um, healthcare managers, et cetera, uh, for the board. They do not collect process data. So I have trouble following patients through. Uh, it's, it's a disaster. Um, hopefully, we will get there, but it's going to be a struggle. You know, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, yeah. I, and and it's 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 you know, it's it's a constant issue with me. <laughs> it's getting better. It's better than way better than it was thirty years ago. Oh, the other one, the other one that I didn't just to throw in, Laurie, that I meant to mention was that the, one of the biggest problems with the current uh, healthcare system is they're still using fax machines. Fax machines are ubiquitous in healthcare, and fax machines are on paper. And if the paper runs out of ink, or the paper gets lost, or the paper gets misfiled. Uh, your referral doesn't go through. People have died because of fax machines, literally. And uh, every other industry has, has eliminated them uh, or, or automated them. And that data it's, is unretrievable, unreadable. Um, it's, uh, anyway, it's, that's, that's, that's one of the first things that's got to go, blow up the fax machines. Somewhat related to the issue of data, question from Ernie Springalow. Aside from potential privacy concerns, why is patient information sharing not highly developed? Is it a resource issue or a cultural one? Yes, <laughs> both. Um, uh, they, they like sharing data, you know, I, I tell people, you know, I can go to Mexico and uh, take money out of, my, out of a bank machine, um, out of my Canadian bank. Um, it took the took the banks. They were spending 14% of their of their money on uh, on implementing information systems, and all it does is get an account number and a password. That's and it was that that was a that was a huge problem. Uh, healthcare and healthcare. You know, you, you've got this constant trade off. Do I spend? I've got a limited budget. Do I spend it on uh, Mike Carter's care, or do I invest in information technology that's going to make things great in ten or twenty years? And it's a tough call. Like it's ethically uh, a, a difficult decision. I'm pushing for, and we're getting there. We're spending more on information technology. Uh, uh, you know, some of the leaders, uh, University Health Network, is spending a lot, uh, and uh, and improving patient care in the process. Uh, but it's a challenge. It's a, you know, is it a and and uh, is it an ethic? Is it a cost question? Absolutely. Is it a a, a system question? Um, it's also very difficult in the decision process. That uh, you know, they, they, there's nobody in charge of the healthcare system. Uh, all of the docs are basically uh, controlling uh, and managing the uh, the decisions. You know, you have to get everybody to agree. The CEO of a hospital is a facilitator. Uh, they're not in charge. <laughs> it's a challenge. Uh, the next question for us engineers in or interested in healthcare: What resources would you recommend for us to stay up to date and network? To stay up to date. I mean, I, I like, I love following Andre Picard in the uh, in the the Globe and Mail. Um, he's all over it. It's if there, there's just so much. Um, uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI.org, is an excellent source. Uh, uh, the, the Canadian Institute for Healthcare Information is an excellent source of information. Um, there's so that, that um, my gang, you know, just following what the Center for Healthcare Engineering, we now have 14 people. We're one of the largest centers for healthcare improvement um, in the world. Uh, and just within uh, mechanical industrial engineering. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, that it, it, it's difficult. It's such a huge, <laughs> I, I always have to focus on a particular problem and then look for the best source for information. 
Uh, the next question, and perhaps the last, are there existing positions or roles in the system for this kind of system level modeling work, or is this currently purely academic and are operated by external consultants? Um, like I would say, like this is not, nothing that I'm doing is academic. So I've got, like I said, you know, we see said at the introduction, I've got hundreds of projects and virtually all of them were collaborations with um, uh, practitioners, with uh, administrators, with clinicians, uh, with agencies, etc. So we were looking at working on real problems and uh, installing real solutions. So I think that I think it's really important. Like I said, the 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 academic part in many respects is fairly easy. Uh, the difficult part is the change management. The difficult part is actually working with the people. So I would I would uh, highly recommend. You know, you know, getting down and and like ten percent of the ten percent of Canadians work in healthcare, so I'm guessing that everybody on the line uh, knows somebody has a relative or a friend or somebody who works in healthcare. Talk to them; they'll tell you about the problems. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I think it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating area growing. That being the case, and since we have run over time, yes, I, I think we would begin. I will begin to wrap up. First of all, by thanking all of the audience members. At one point, I counted 163 participants online. I would like to thank them for all of their questions. And obviously, Professor Carter, I would like to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for such an informative an entertaining presentation, especially with all those cartoons on healthcare engineering. To everyone who joined us here today, we invite you to share your feedback on the School Lunch and Learn series. We are always looking for your feedback. A link to this online survey will be made available in the chat and will be shared with all of you after this event. This presentation has been recorded and will also be shared with all registered guests early next week. For your information, the School Lunch and Learn events are traditionally hosted on the second Wednesday of each month. Our next event will be on Wednesday, November 10th, featuring Professor Burson Donmez, whose presentation is entitled, Do Smarter Cars Mean Safer Driving? In the era of pending autonomous cars, that's, a, that's an interesting question. For more information about our next School Lunch and Learn presentation, we ask that you visit the School Lunch and Learn Engineering website. In closing, we would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor for Lunch and Learn, MBNA, through U of T's pillar sponsorship program. If you're interested in learning more about School Lunch and Learn, please contact the alumni office at events at engineering.utoronto.ca. In closing, I would like to thank you all for joining us for today's presentation, and I hereby adjourn today's session of School Lunch and Learn. Have a safe and healthy rest of the day. Thank you all.